Thank you very much and good morning. Glad to be here today. Yeah, water and weather. I think they fit. I think they fit. I, um, I've been a meteorologist for a long, long time. A broadcast meteorologist. And of course that means my job is to report on the weather, right? Simple enough. But like anybody who probably stands on this stage for creative mornings, there's a little more to it than that. Uh, quite a bit more to it, in fact. There we go. Um, ever since I was a little kid, the weather was a basic part of the news program. That is to say, the news, which is news and weather and sports, Back in the 60s and 70s, families would sit around and watch the news as a family. I think that's changed a little bit. But news, weather, and sports, those three things always went together. The things that you need to know. The things that you want to know. And back in the day, there were only a few small ways you could get that information. When I was young, it was the newspaper or the television or the radio, and that was it. This, where's my phone? I'm always losing my phone. I'm always losing my phone, Emily says. Now we have this little device, which presents uh, all kinds of other ways, and for me, all sorts of problems. But the weather, as part of the news, weather, and sports, and what you need to know, really is part of the free press, is it not? And the free press comes out of the First Amendment. Let's talk about this for just a little bit. The First Amendment. In fact, let me read to you the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. Congress shall pass no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Do you ever think about the First Amendment? Do you ever think about why the Founding Fathers put those four things into the First Amendment? And what does this have to do with the weather? Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and the right to gather and talk about what's on our minds, specifically with what's wrong with our government. These four rights, why are they tied together? I happen to think that there's a specific reason why these four rights are tied together. And it has to do a lot with the first one, religion, philosophy, thought, how we think, speech. Try to have a thought without words. Okay, other than maybe pleasure and pain and hunger, you can't. You can't have a thought without words. We think with language. And so... The way we think is tied forever to speech and words and language. And our early government people realized this and recognized that that needed to be tied with the freedom of the press and an opportunity to complain to our government about things that we didn't like. It's our inner selves. It really is. We the people. And it is in fact a tool of we the people is the free press that is the watchdog of our government that helps us recognize how things are going. The press is our tool. And I think maybe somewhere along the line it's possible that we may have lost sight of that just a little bit in today's world. And I blame the phone for that. By the way, the free press, that doesn't mean you don't have to pay for it. It means free from government intrusion, right? You are expected to pay for it, and you always have in one way or another. In my line of work, the traditional form of, of uh, payment has been advertising. Yeah. By the way, 
a little thing about the founding fathers and going way back to 1791 when the Bill of Rights was ratified is that our U.S. Postal Service was one of the first things enacted upon by the federal government in the very early days of this country. And the reason for that is because the early founding fathers recognized that the free press was necessary in 1791 before we had this device. The free press was necessary to keep people engaged with their government. And in fact, one of the first things that the Postal Service did was establish bulk rates for newspapers so that those newspapers could be distributed. In fact, in the late 1700s and early 1800s, you could mail a bundle of newspapers from New York to Boston way cheaper than you could mail a letter. Think about it, the way that uh, uh, these things happened then. You didn't send a text. You wrote a letter, you sealed it, you gave it to somebody who was going to put it on a stagecoach who was hopefully going to where you wanted to go, probably making a few stops along the way. It was complicated. It would take weeks for a letter to get from New York to Boston, or at the very minimum days, and it depended on the stage routes and other things. But, you know, I digress. After all, I'm just the weatherman, right? So let's talk a little bit about weather. And let's talk, go back to the free press and this device. Where do you get your weather from? Is it one of these? Is that a good thing? Do you get your weather from an Instagram, from some dude you met at the OB last Friday? Do you get it from an app on your phone? Where does that information come from? Who puts that information into the app on your phone? I don't know, it's just the weather. I'm asking you to think about that for just a little bit today. It might be important. Who's the source? Do you trust it? And of course, this relates back to where you get your news and the free press and the First Amendment and the Bill of Rights and all of that. Do you trust where you get your information from? Are you using your First Amendment guaranteed, your Bill of Rights guaranteed free press as effectively and efficiently as you could be. No doubt back in 1791 as today, when you were seeking information, you had to check a variety of sources, as we do today. In fact, I read a book a few years ago, an autobiography of Ben Franklin. Everybody learned in school about poor Richard's almanac and his newspaper business. Ben Franklin said that if you want to get the truth, you must read as many newspapers as you can get your hands on. Because in 1791, newspapers were funded to some extent by advertising, but also generally underwritten by someone who had money. And that someone who had money would underwrite the newspaper for one reason and one reason only, and that was to get their particular side of the story published. We also had in that day and age the town crier. Anybody know what a town crier is? Hear ye, hear ye, the news of today is this. All right, I pay this guy to tell my side of the news. Somebody else pays somebody else to tell the other side of the news. They're on different corners. They're trying to outshout each other. We do the same thing today, it's just a different medium. A lot has changed since then. Town crier's dead. Newspapers, Rick, I have to be careful when I say this, don't I? <laughs> Newspapers not dead yet, but it's, it's definitely struggling. Newspapers all across the world are struggling to make money. The broadcast business is actually doing okay, but it's changing dramatically, and it is struggling in a sense. We are having trouble finding sources of revenue. People are not watching TV, and certainly not the news. We're making a lot more news shows available for you to watch. We have news at my station at 4, and at 5, and at 6, and at 9, and at 10. We have two hours plus in the morning, and we're thinking of expanding that. When I first started at WDOI, there was a show at 6 and a show was at 10, and everybody watched it. 
Why don't people watch the news anymore? I don't know. You tell me. I got into this business because I thought people were going to watch me, right? Uh, there's so many distractions now. For one thing, there's so many different news channels. There's so many different non-news channels. Who wants to watch the news when you've got Netflix, streaming video games? What else? Social media. Of course, I know, unlike my generation, supposedly a lot of this generation can do two or three of these things at once. But I'm not sure, therefore, when I have the weather report on, that I have your undivided attention. It's possible you're being distracted by something. So we have to work very hard in my line of work to find people, to reach people, and to keep and retain an audience. And that's really what this talk is about today. I have to be useful. My message has to be credible. I have a brand. We work hard to develop a brand at WDAY, and that brand has to be spread as, to as many places across the world wide web as we can find people who will pay attention to and come back for more information from us. And then my company has to find ways to profit from this. And it changes daily. So it's a very complex thing. And we have to do this while trying to maintain our credibility. You've probably all seen YouTubes of the Russian newscaster slowly taking off her clothes as she reads the news. If you haven't, Google it. It's easy to find. There are many of them out there. I'm not sure that would be a good ploy for me to try that method, but <laughs> I'm also not sure I would maintain my credibility if I did that. So keeping credible, keeping useful, while keeping people interested. It's a difficult thing to do. And through all of that, we have to be ethical as well. So when a friend of mine a few months ago said, hey, John, I've got a gig for you. I'm going to get you, if you want, in front of maybe a couple hundred people to talk about the weather, and the only stipulation is it has to have something to do with creativity and water, I thought, I'm there. Maybe I'll find a few people that I can talk to. Maybe one or two of them will start watching the news. That's what I'm all about, and that's what I'm all about today. So, second part of the talk. Weather is water. Weather is water. Bob Dylan. Some people in my generation think of Bob Dylan as a prophet. I'm not sure about that. Not sure about that at all. But I do know this, Bob Dylan's a heck of a poet. And one of, his fa one of my favorite songs of Bob Dylan has a line in it, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. I'm not sure about that either. <laughs> but it's a good poem. It's a very good poem. And I think that that line is really not about the uselessness of the weatherman. I think it's really probably some kind of metaphor about a repressive government or something like that. But it's great poetry. And it does tell me that whether or not you even believe in prophets, you can recognize a good poem. So let's start with Psalm 22 from the Old Testament. I'm sure you've heard this if you've ever been to a funeral. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Without water, life itself would be impossible. In fact, the search for life on other planets is really about the search for water. We've been trying to find life on Mars, but it's too cold, too dry. There probably was water there once. There may have been life there once, but we can't find any now. When I was a kid back in the 60s, I read a lot of sci-fi books, and there were several books. There was one whole series of, I don't remember the series, but it was like the Hardy Boy books only in space. Yeah, right. Um, Anyway, the planet Venus was presented as a swampy, jungly, uh, animal-infested, uh, wet planet. But that was wonderful science fiction. Turns out the surface of Venus looks more like this. 
because Venus has a runaway greenhouse effect. And in fact, the temperature on the surface of Venus is hotter than the broiler setting in your oven. There is no life on Venus because all of their water is gone. No water, no life. Now, I'm not trying to dispel your hopes and dreams of finding life in, elsewhere in the universe. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. What I am suggesting, though, is so far it's been hard to find. And it's been hard to find because Earth, while maybe not unique in the universe, almost certainly not unique, is certainly rare in the sense that it has water in its atmosphere. And not only that, it has water in all three phases of gas and liquid and solid and we need that our bodies are significantly made up of water some 60 to 65 percent of our bodies are water 80 to 85 percent of our brain is water in fact the atmosphere the water in the atmosphere is critical to life as we know it. Interestingly enough, our atmosphere doesn't have a lot of water in it. Atmosphere is mostly nitrogen, which is an inert gas. Oxygen is there, we know that, that's very important. The third most relevant gas is the little thin yellow strip, that's argon. And then after that, there's a bunch of chemicals up there. Water is a tiny, tiny fraction of it. Yet have you ever walked across uh, your living room, carpeted room, and then touched a doorknob and gotten a shock in wintertime? Or have you ever sat on your back deck in the summertime and wiped your brow complaining about the humidity? That's too little or too much humidity is what makes those things. Water is very important in our atmosphere and into the way that we live our lives, even if it is a very small part of the makeup of the atmosphere. I'm a sucker for epic poetry. So, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner will kind of get this thing started off. Just listen to this. You know the story of the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner? It's a wooden ship. They're traveling all around the globe and bad things happen to them. And in this particular passage, the, the uh, wooden ship is gradually being frozen in the ice in wintertime in the southern latitudes near Antarctica. And now there came both mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold. The ice mast high came floating by, as green as emerald. And through the drifts the snowy cliffs did send a dismal sheen, nor shapes of men nor beasts we ken. The ice was all between. The ice was here, the ice was there, the ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a swooned. 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 Think, that's an old word. It's an archaic word. It means a swoon. Imagine the sound of somebody fainting. I'm not talking about a cartoon faint. I mean literally somebody passing out. Okay? Think of that sound for just a minute. That groany, moany sound. That's the sound that the ice makes as it's freezing and growing and expanding and starting to break up your wooden ship. It's wonderful imagery from that poem. Well, they get out of that somehow and later are stuck in the doldrums in the tropics, all in a hot and copper sky, the bloody sun at noon, right up above the masted stand, no bigger than the moon. Day after day, day after day, as idle as a painted ship, we stuck nor breath nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Water, water everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. Hopefully now I've whetted your appetite a little bit about water in the atmosphere and water on the world, water in the earth and water in weather, so we can actually get to the speech. So we've had the pre-speech, the introduction, the transition, and now this is the speech, okay? Water in the atmosphere. That's really what I came to talk to you about today, and that's a picture of my house. 
I took that picture less than three weeks ago, and the snow's shrunk a little bit since then, but we've been accumulating snow all winter. And what I want to talk to you today about, and what I want to do is try to get you excited about to illustrate how in my job, what I have to do is not only report on the weather, but make it interesting so that people will come back. So let's talk about how snow melts, because there's a lot of thing about how snow melts that you may not think about. Snow accumulates. And this winter it accumulated and accumulated and accumulated. 59 inches of snow we've gotten so far this winter. You see on this uh, last picture, there is on my, the back of my house a flat roof. The day after I made this picture, I had to shovel that off because when the water comes off the top of the house and drains onto the flat roof, if there's a lot of snow there, it collects in the snow. And because that was about a two and a half foot pile of snow there, it actually drains into my kitchen if I don't shovel that off. The rest of the snow in the house I didn't have to worry about. That particular bit I did get shoveled off. Snow got pretty deep this winter. What is snowfall accumulation? You ever think about that? You know, when rain falls, you measure it in a bucket. It rains a little bit, there's some kind of a gauge on the side of the bucket, it rains a little more, you re read a little more. You can't measure snow like that. You can't call me at the TV station hour by hour through the day and say, John, how much did it snow so far? You can't do that. You ever thought about why? Can you imagine why? As snow falls, it settles. Snow is not just snow. Snow is ice crystals and air. Because, in fact, how much snow is falling as it falls in the sky is not even a thing. You can't say, how much snow is that? You can measure it, gauge it in terms of the visibility, but that's complicated by wind. How much snow lands on the ground? If you measure that every two minutes, the crystals haven't broken, and so you're going to get a ridiculously high amount of snow. If you wait until after the snowstorm to measure the snow, that's no good because the snow will have settled. The wind may have come up partway through a storm. There was a storm we had here right after Christmas this year in which at one point in the afternoon, as I was walking to work, I measured in several places and caught nine inches. The official Fargo observer was out of town that day, did not get back into town until evening, registered, measured the snow at the end of the day after the wind had come up, and we got seven and a half inches of snow that day, not nine. I know it was nine inches deep. At one point, the official measurer didn't. So there are rules about how we measure snow. That's a rare case because, because it doesn't always work that way. Usually our observer is here in town. But there are rules. There are places in mountain locations that can get feet of snow in a day. The rule is you can measure it no more than four times a day and no fewer than four hours between measurements. So we always have a measurement first thing in the morning. There's always a measurement at around midnight so we can uh, observe how much snow fell during a calendar day. And because of the media, there's usually a measurement shortly before the six o'clock news. There was a storm back in early March when my Facebook lit up because it was a Saturday, I wasn't working, but people want to know how come we can't find out how much snow has fallen today? And the answer is because it hasn't been measured yet because it isn't time. So snow measuring is difficult. Any snowstorm typically, just one storm, is going to be about 10% ice crystals and about 90% air. I mean, that's why you can make a snowball, right? Because it packs. Step on snow, it crushes. That's mostly air. That's not precipitation. Most of these piles even that you see outside are not what they once were. On March 10th, the official Fargo observer took a snow core sample and melted it to get the water content of the snow. On that day, we had our peak average depth of the winter at 25 inches. And it was 4.76 inches of water in it, which meant on March 10th, which was the same day that I took those pictures of my house, that was about 19% water and 81% air in the snowpack. 
first few days we had melting, a lot of people wrote me and said, hey, Mr. Wheeler, there isn't going to be a flood this year because the snow is all melting. It's melting into itself. The water wasn't going away. It was just collapsing. Most of the water is still in that snow out there today. In fact, earlier this week on Tuesday, there was another snow core sample. The depth of the snow was uh, dropped quite a bit. And on Tuesday, it was 35% water and my typo there, 65% air. That was the makeup of the snow this week on Tuesday. That was based on a 14-inch depth, and it's down now. It's probably dropped down to about 10 or 11 inches because we've had quite a bit of melting the last few days. It's now, as of Tuesday, the water out there and the snow is about 31% of the content. There's been some melting since then. Let's say it's 50-50. You can still pack that snow. It's still about half air and about half water. So... How are we going to melt this snow? How does snow melt? How does snow melt? Snow is bright. It's white. It's highly reflective. And that means that it's not getting a lot of sunlight into it. And it's not getting a lot of solar radiation into it. In fact, when snow falls in the winter, our winters tend to start getting colder. When the snow is very deep, like it was the second half of this winter, we tend to get a lot of very cold weather. In fact, I'll tell you a little story, a little, a little interesting fact. All of the weather records in January, February, March, and April, you could probably include December and November in that as well. Every single one of the cold weather season. Every single weather record for those five months. The record highs are all in situations when there is no snow on the ground in Fargo, and the record lows are all in situations when the ground is covered in snow. It makes that big of a difference. In fact, we estimate this time of year in the spring, rule of thumb is the difference between there being snow on the ground and no snow on the ground is a 10 to 25 degree difference in temperature. It would be a lot warmer today if we did not have all this snow on the ground. In fact, watch. When this snow melts, the first 70-degree day of spring in Fargo will likely happen within a few days of the snow going away. I mean, maybe we'll have a cold front and uh, it'll be delayed by a few days, but it happens like that when the snow goes away. Average first 70-degree day, by the way, is April 17th in Fargo. So... Why is it average? That doesn't mean it's going to happen like that this year. <laughs> April 17th. Uh, I bet it'll be a little late this year, but it'll be in April. It'll be in April. All right. Latent heat. One of the reasons that... Watch the video here. One of the reasons that... Uh, that our, snow, that our snow makes the air so cold, sun beams down on the ground, a lot of that energy is then reflected out into space. You can tell because the, uh, sun, that because the snow is so terribly bright. The thing is the sunlight energy begins to melt that snow and a significant amount of that energy then goes into the conversion of the snow into water. I'm going to say that again. A lot of the energy goes into the converting of that snow into water. And that cools the air right near the snow. And that's the reason why our lower atmosphere stays so cool, even as the weather is beginning to warm up. Back in the first thawing days a couple of weeks ago, the temperature rose up to about 34 degrees and stopped. Since then, we've had a day or two that have been in the low 40s. It can't get warm until we get rid of that snow. It can't. There was a science experiment that I recall from middle school in which one of those things that you never forget. We had a beaker with water in it, tap water out of the sink. We had a Bunsen burner and a stand. And we had a thermometer in the water. And we had to make a graph. Everybody in class had to make a graph. And we plotted temperature versus time. I guess it would have been time versus temperature. It doesn't matter. And as we turned on the Bunsen burner, began heating the water, the temperature rose at a constant rate on that graph. 
until it started to boil, and then the temperature of the water stayed the same as the water boiled away. And we didn't let the water boil away completely. <coughs> Pardon me. But we did let the water drain down. Where was that heat going when the temperature of the water wasn't going up anymore? We're still adding heat to the system, but the temperature of the water didn't change. It's going into the phase change. It was changing that water from liquid to vapor. That requires energy. That energy is then stored in the water vapor as latent heat. And that's how thunderstorms grow, but that's another topic. We'll talk about that another day. The same thing happens in the winter time as we're taking snow, as we're taking water from its snow phase, its ice phase, its solid phase into a liquid. It requires energy. So when we're melting snow, the air doesn't warm up until the snow goes away and then boom, you get warm weather. That's kind of neat, huh? Wind, as the graphic demonstrates, can blow away some of the coldest air that is, help, that is held near the snow, and that can encourage uh, warming up just a little bit. There's another interesting thing about melting snow, and that is that high humidity makes snow melt very fast. In the Rocky Mountains, where the winters are very dry, there are valleys out there that can maintain one, two, three inches of, of snow all winter long with day after day warming up into the 40s and 50s and the snow hardly melts because the air is so dry. The reason for that is when the air is very, very humid, it's full of water vapor, 100% humidity. All of those molecules are trying to be squeezed out by the pressures of 100% humidity. And so molecule by molecule, those molecules are adhering to the snow and not allowing the little molecules that are popping off that snow to be melted to do so. And if they do, they immediately refreeze back on. So what happens is when it's very humid, the snow just melts away because we don't get that latent heat effect. The flood of 2010, nine years ago, not the big one of 2009, the next year, surprised all of us because the snow melted in a week. I remember us saying on TV, we're at least three weeks away from the river crest. It crested in a week. Very fast melt. Ended up being almost as bad as the 2009 flood. Happened because we had a week of 35 degrees in fog, day and night. Snow just got eaten. Another thing that happens in spring, and you can see it out there right now, is the snow gets ugly, gets dirty. White snow is highly reflective. Over the course of the winter time, and especially as we get into spring, every day a little bit of that snow melts, whether it's sunlight or just a mild day. And when it refreezes at night, it doesn't refreeze as crystals, but as granules. Those granules, instead of being the bright white reflective snowflake pile, are sort of a gray, dull, less reflective body, they absorb a little bit more of that sunlight. The snow here in town gets dirty too from the plows. Out in the country it can get dirty from a little blowing dirt. All of these things help the snow to melt and eventually it does. Eventually the snow all goes away and we have spring. So that is how snow melts and that is one way that I hope I have intrigue some of you to think a little bit about snow and maybe think, hey, this, this Wheeler guy's a little interesting. My weather shows are on in the evening and they're not nearly as long as this, so you don't have to tune in very long. But I hope some of you do. That is my presentation. Thank you very much for listening today.